<laughs> All right, how's that? Okay. Better. All right, well, first of all, while Hugh is giving his report, I apologize, but I was busy flipping through the hymnal here and found the Nicene Creed. Uh, it's uh, 739. So um, now, now you know where to find a copy. And of course, uh, as my students, you also know that it's not just the Nicene Creed, it's the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. So impress your friends and relatives with uh, your multi-syllabic understanding of the creed here. Uh, impress them even more, learn it in Greek. Um, <laughs> We're going to try and uh, pick up where we left off last week and get through what I planned to get through last week. So you'll see the same image that we started with last week, this image of Christ uh, in imperial garb, reminding us that uh, as we'll continue to look at today, there was very close association in the East between imperial authority and uh, church authority, ecclesiastical authority couple of differences from uh, what you may be more familiar with with Western culture. First of all, um, how many of you have ever read or even heard of um, uh, Edwin Gibbon's famous work, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire? Right? Okay, very good. When did the Roman Empire fall? 400s, uh, 476 is one year. That's the year that uh, Gibbons used. Because uh, what happened in 476? We don't know, the empire fell. <laughs> um, the last emperor in the West was deposed by uh, German uh, invaders. Those people that uh, when I was in fifth grade, we called the barbarians, right? Uh, barbarian is just the Greek word for stranger. And um, so uh, the Germans uh, from the area of Northern Europe that the Romans called Germania, so Germans, not to be confused with those who live in a particular nation state today, but they began migrating into the empire, eventually uh, establishing various states in Western Europe. And that's uh, history for a whole nother time period. As far as the Romans were concerned, meaning not those who live in the city of Rome, but those who consider themselves a part of the empire established by Romulus and Remus, um, you know, many centuries before, as far as the Romans were concerned, the capital of the empire was now Constantinople. And they continue to view themselves as Romans, as subjects of an imperial Roman emperor until well, we can be pretty precise with this date. Um, anybody know uh, when Constantinople um, falls to the Ottoman Turks? No, no. So, and I'm really one of those professors that don't care a lot about, you know, precise dates, but this is an important one. 1453, there is a great Christian city Constantinople, that is the capital of what has, as we've been tracing here, is coming to be seen as an Orthodox Christian empire. And so we're seeing the two things develop here together, imperial power, that again, they trace back to the very, well, uh, to Augustus, at least, if we're talking empire. Before that, of course, Rome was a republic, but they trace back to the time of Augustus, and um, uh, a church then, the leadership of which is provided by two bodies. One of these bodies is the so-called patriarchates. I'm going to give you a pop quiz. What were the five major patriarchates of the ancient world? I'm going to give you the first one, Rome, because we're going to throw it out. It's over in the West. Alexandria and Egypt. Antioch in Syria, modern day Turkey, Constantinople, not quite Moscow yet. Uh, it's it's going to come along, but uh, Jerusalem, right? All of those, again, in the East, what we would call the Middle East or Western Asia, or in the case of Alexandria, of course, North Africa. 
And so as divisions begin, when, when the last emperor in the West is deposed, um, to be replaced by whom? Who once again wears an imperial crown in Western Europe? Guy named Charlie. Charlie? Char Charlie the Great, they called him. Charlemagne. Charlemagne, Latin for Charles the Great, right? In the year 800, has the imperial, the old imperial crown placed upon his head by Pope Leo III. And so now you have another person in the West claiming to be an emperor. So the churches in the West and the imperial power is going to develop very differently than what happens in the East, where you have always an emperor on the throne in Constantinople, and you have then a patriarch in Constantinople who is known as first among equals, right? Yeah, figure that one out. Um, but you also have these patriarchates then in Antioch, Jerusalem, and Alexandria, right? So ecclesiastical power is going to be more diffuse in the East because you have these four patriarchates. Plus, as we talked a little bit about last week, the East is going to say anytime there is a major theological issue, it has to be resolved by doing what? The emperor calling a council, right? We've talked about it first with Constantine summoning the Council of Nicaea, with Theodosius calling together the Council of Constantinople, with the Bishop of Alexandria calling together the Council of Ephesus. Wait a minute, who? Uh, what happened to the emperor on that one? Uh, he gets brought in later, right? Um, but eventually the emperor is going to accept Ephesus as the third ecumenical, you remember what that word means? Worldwide, well, universal in a way. Catholic is uh, another term, they're very similar, but um, the worldwide uh, Christian church recognizes, according to the East, these three councils, where when you have a theological issue, this is what you do. You summon, the emperor summons a council, or at least approves one, and the councils then make a theological decision, and who's in charge then of enforcing that and making sure that the people of the empire profess the orthodox faith? The emperor, right? So this is what we've been building up to here. Um, so let's, you'll remember last week after the Council of Constantinople, or really uh, during the time of the Council of Ephesus, the Patriarch of Constantinople, a fellow by the name of Nestorius, made the argument that in Christ there were two distinct separate natures. There was a totally divine nature, a totally human nature. They did not intermix, he said. Therefore, it's improper to communicate the idioms. Remember what that meant? So you just, I'm a professor. I have to test you all the time, right? I, I, even though I said this morning, it's nice coming in and talking to folks who aren't worried about a grade. Um, I, I still have to, you know, give you a little bit of a test here. So yes mean by what? Idioms. An idiom in Greek is a characteristic particular to a thing. <laughs> a characteristic particular to a thing. So we might say uh, the characteristic particular to this laptop is the evil demons that run. No, I'm, uh, this, <laughs> this is Stuart's laptop. I, I'm sure it's been exercised. Um, but um, an idiom is a, a characteristic that is peculiar to a particular thing. So when Christians began honoring the Virgin Mary as Theotokos in Greek, the bearer of God, or as it typically gets translated into English, the mother of God, Nestorius said, that's incorrect. You can't take the idioms, the characteristics that describe divinity and apply those to the human Jesus. You can apply them to the divine son, but you can't apply them to the human Jesus. So 
This is why the Council of Ephesus is summoned. Cyril, the Archbishop of, uh, or the Patriarch actually, of Alexandria, has uh, Nestorius, the Patriarch of Constantinople, thrown out of the church. And the development then of the so-called Church of the East, which um, uh, you may remember um, last time, uh, it often goes by the name the Nestorian Church. Um, they do not like that title. They're still around. Again, the largest Christian group in Iraq at the beginning of the Iraq War was the Assyrian Church. It was a part of this Church of the East, Nestorian. They don't like the term Nestorian. In fact, a lot of religions come to be known by names that they didn't choose themselves. The Quakers, the Baptists, the Methodists. Anybody know how, how you got the name Methodist? When, when John and Charles Wesley were students at Oxford University, they organized something called the Holy Club. I can just imagine that going over like a lead balloon nowadays. Um, the Holy Club, where they pledged to one another to th live their lives according to rule and method. And the other students at Oxford began making fun of them, calling them Methodist, right? So a lot of, a lot of the uh, titles of uh, religions that we talk about, religious groups, were actually meant to be originally um, offensive, right, and, and come to be embraced. At any rate, uh, yes? You're absolutely right, yes, yes. And, and another uh, indication of the importance of Antioch to Christian history, but uh, this was, again, a name that was uh, given to them by those who uh, opposed them or, or at least uh, uh, didn't understand them in some way. Um, at any rate, the Church of the East breaks off uh, from Constantinople and becomes, as we looked at last week, uh, the preeminent Christian form in a large part of Asia, right? Even if you remember last week, I showed you a little picture of the so-called Nestorian stele that gives us an account of Christianity in this particular form making its way to the great capital of Tang, China. Uh, and explaining Christianity then. So we have, uh, Hugh was talking earlier about divisions. Um, Christianity is uh, in many ways a history of divisions. And here's one of the first ones. The Church of the East accepts only those first two councils. Obviously, they don't accept the Council of Ephesus. Um, other patriarchates do. So, well, in fact, uh, here, uh, just again, I love the imagery, uh, art. Um, here is a Syriac um, uh, document showing, um, this is from the Church of the East. So it's written in a Syriac script. Arabic is also one of the languages that the Church of the East used. And uh, you see an image here of Constantine, the founder of the capital city of Constantinople, and uh, his uh, mother, Helen, here who is the patron saint of Christian archaeology. Anybody ever heard of Helen before? She, um, she traveled over to uh, Jerusalem and uh, was the world's luckiest archaeologist. She dug up the true cross, the three nails, uh, the um, uh, lance that was used to pierce the side of Jesus, the crown of thorns, um, she was, she was pretty good, right? So she became the, the uh, patron saint of archaeology. Um, at any rate, let's move on then to a fourth council. We still have some issues over what it means to talk about Christ as both fully human and fully divine. And so in the middle of the fifth century, there's another council summoned at a little town outside of Constantinople. Uh, notice again, well, although we haven't gone through them all, the first eight councils, although the Orthodox Church recognizes only seven of them, the first eight councils of Christianity take place in Asia. Most of them in and around the city of Constantinople. Ephesus is the one that's furthest away. So Chalcedon is a little town near Constantinople. The emperor again summons a council to meet there, 
and to come up once again with some sort of statement of what it means to talk about this dual nature of Christ. And uh, this is a particular image from a, an Orthodox monastery um, on Mount Athos uh, off the coast of Greece, a uh, very, very famous um, uh, monastery. And uh, they have then um, paintings, frescoes of uh, all of the seven ecumenical councils recognized by Orthodox Christians. So uh, this is a, a image then of this Council of Chalcedon. Um, notice you've got a, a dove up here at the top, symbolizing the Holy Spirit, right? So again, the idea is that in these councils, the beliefs of the apostles are being expressed through the Holy Spirit, giving the leadership to uh, the emperor or um, the uh, uh, leaders here um, who are gathered around. Again, uh, and unfortunately, we're not going to have time to get into uh, art too much about uh, Orthodox art, but again, two-dimensional. Uh, this is going to be another hallmark of what Orthodox Christianity will uh, accept as a way of uh, expressing some of these ideas uh, is two-dimensional flat artwork, icons, rather than statues such as the church in the West is going to use. At any rate, what happens at the Council of Chalcedon? Well, let me read for you. First of all, they decide we're not going to revise the creed, right? The creed is going to say, again, look in uh, the Methodist hymnal. The creed that you have in there is the Nicene Constantinopolitan creed that was written in the fourth century. We're not going to change that, but we're going to define it a little more. So here's the definition of Chalcedon. We do declare that the exposition of the right and blameless faith made by the 318 holy and blessed fathers assembled at Nicaea in the reign of Constantine. So we're looking back to the Nicene Council um, of pious memory shall be preeminent. And uh, also the one of 150 holy fathers at Constantinople for the uprooting of heresies, which had then sprung up and, the converse, uh, and for the converse, confirmation of the same Catholic and apostolic faith of ours. So again, we're looking at uh, Nicaea, we're looking at Constantinople, those are settled, All right? So, but following therefore the holy fathers, I think I may have this on the next slide, let's see, no. Um, so we'll stay here for a minute. Following the Holy Fathers, we unanimously teach that the Son is to be confessed the same person as our Lord Jesus Christ, that he is perfect in divinity, perfect in humanity, truly God and truly human, composed of a rational soul and human body, the same substance, same substance, homoousios, remember that? So the same substance as the Father in regard to his divinity and the same substance as us regarding our humanity. Um, the same as, as us in all things except sin. Uh, we confess that this one and the same Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son, be acknowledged as having two natures without any confusion or change, without any division or separation, uh, two natures in one person. And I've, I've really cut to the chase on this. It's a little more loquacious. You know, I mean, these are, by this time, these are professional church lawyers. And uh, we don't have any lawyers in here, do we? Um, <laughs> you know, so they have to fill it up with a lot of different words. But anyway, um, this, is, this is how Chalcedon uh, defines, again, this notion of uh, fully divine, fully human. It's finally settled, right? Well... These were some of the reactions. I put Nestorius up here um, just to remind you of him. But remember, at this point, he's out of the picture. So uh, there were those who were uh, said to be monophysites. Again, you got a lot of $10 words you can impress your family with here. Uh, monophysites. Fusis, the Greek word, uh, fusis, meaning nature. Um, mono, of course, meaning single one so a monophysite monophysism says well surely even if christ had two natures the divine nature was so overwhelming 
that it just overwhelmed his human nature. After all, who would voluntarily uh, be crucified unless it were his divine nature, knowing it's for the salvation of the world, that would lead him to do this? So the divine nature just totally overwhelms the human nature. That's monophysitism. Well, here's the response. One of the responses, Christ had two distinct natures, again, fully human and fully divine, in one unique composite nature. So there's a human nature and a divine nature, but together they are one in some way. That becomes meophysitism. Take your notes carefully. There will be a test. Finally, then, there are the diophysites. Christ had two distinct natures, fully human and fully divine, in one person. I just read you the uh, uh, definition at Chalcedon. Uh, which did Chalcedon decide upon? The last one. Very good. Very good. Chalcedon takes the diophysite position. This becomes orthodoxy. This becomes, again, the responsibility of the emperor to be sure that the people who claim to be Christian living in his empire profess the correct understanding of the two natures in Christ. The churches in the Middle East, including the Patriarchate of Antioch, Patriarchate of Jerusalem, and the churches in Africa, including the Patriarchate of Alexandria, refuse to accept this. They become, they're, they're the Byzantines, the, the Orthodox, are going to say, well, they're all just monophysites. No, they're not. They, they are meophysites. So really, hear the distinction here, if you can. Two natures, fully divine and fully human, uh, in one person. Or two natures, fully divine and fully human, in one nature. What's the difference? We're not sure. But they were. They were. And so, oh, here's the definition of Chalcedon. Uh, see how much I cut it for you? We're not going to go through all of that. Um, so what does this mean? What does this mean? It means that of the four patriarchates that are in the eastern part of the empire, Three of them now have rejected a council and begin disassociating themselves with Constantinople and begin moving then again back into Asia. You see at the top here the so-called Nestorian. This is Church of the East, the red. Um, then you've got uh, Syrian, and this particular map says Monophysite. They, the churches say they are not Monophysite, they are Meophysite. But you see them coming down into Asia, making their way to India. One of the oldest Christian groups in India are called the St. Thomas Christians. And we don't really know a great deal about their origins. Obviously, from their name, they claim this Christian community in southern India was founded by St. Thomas, one of the disciples of Jesus. In fact, famous for doing what? Doubt, right? So... Uh, this is Doubting Thomas, as he's called, but afterwards coming into India, uh, when Western explorers, Portuguese, began coming into India uh, in the 15th century, they were shocked to find Christian communities there, All right? So these are uh, Syriac Christians. Down into Africa then, um, well, let me, we'll come back to that one. Down into Africa, uh, Nubia. Ethiopia, Egypt up at the top, all of these are great Christian communities in communion with the Patriarchate of Alexandria. They likewise reject Chalcedonian orthodoxy. And so what begins to develop then, as we've looked at some in here, are very Africanized forms of Christianity, Africanized in the sense of the art, the architecture, and these sorts of things begin to take on uh, African culture. Um, uh, uh, African uh, dark-skinned bishops, and also, uh, as we've seen before, if you were here for some of the uh, discussion of uh, the Virgin Mary, um, 
figures of the Holy Family again, presented uh, very African. In fact, these churches are going to say, had it not been for Africa, there would be no Christianity. Why? Because where is it that the Holy Family flees when there are those sent from Herod seeking to uh, uh, kill the male children? They go into Egypt, right? So this is, this is a scene that you see in a lot of African Christian churches. Um, also in Ethiopia, how many of you are familiar with the churches of Labiella? Ever heard of those? Magnificent. I didn't know anything about them until about 10 years ago, and I actually had a student do a project on them. And I'm sitting there watching the student do the project with my mouth dropped open going, I've never heard of this. Wow. But um, these are churches. This is rock. And these churches are carved out of rock straight down. Um, just amazing, amazing. It's on my bucket list, but it's near the uh, region now where there's civil war going on in uh, Ethiopia. So uh, uh, if you want to experience Ethiopia without going over there, I recommend the restaurant that's right around the corner here, Odyssey. Um, great Ethiopian food, and uh, you'll see some of the, the artwork in there reflecting Ethiopian orthodoxy. Ethiopia is a majority Christian country in Africa. In fact, it is the only part of Africa that was never colonized by Western powers. And part of this is because they are Christian, but they are non-Chalcedonian Christians, right? So uh, let's go back just a minute. Uh, uh, I usually don't like putting a lot of words on uh, slides, but um, uh, sometimes it's convenient. Just to go back again to what we were talking about the first time we met, we make a distinction between those churches that we call Eastern Orthodox and those that we call Oriental Orthodox. Here's where that distinction comes in. The churches that reject the Council of Chalcedon, so the non-Chalcedonian Miophysite churches, we collectively call today the Oriental Orthodox. And you'll notice it's uh, churches here in Africa. I know it's very small, but uh, the Coptic church in Egypt, about 10% of Egypt's population is Coptic Christianity. And uh, the Coptic church is an Oriental Orthodox church, not in communion with Constantinople over this council that took place in the fifth century. Uh, Armenia, we haven't even gotten into Armenia. Armenia was totally separate, um, uh, but uh, again, a very, very old Christian region. Uh, the Ethiopian church, the Eritrean, after uh, Eritrea broke away from uh, Ethiopia, what about 20, 30 years ago, um, they're recognized as having their own separate church. And then again, down here, the church of the East. So. When we're talking about Orthodox Christianity, most people mean to talk about Eastern Orthodoxy, and that's fine, but there are also these other uh, great branches that have broken off as a result of disagreement at one of the councils, right? And these churches are all growing here in this country. Assyrian Orthodox, after the Iraq War, a lot of Christians migrated to the West, to Europe and America. Uh, my daughter lives in Nashville, and on our way to her house, we pass by a Coptic Antiochian uh, Orthodox Church. And if you go online and read in the uh, um, uh, About Us part that's online, it says, we accept the holy councils of Nicaea, Constantinople, and Ephesus. And after that, everything went wrong. So we, we, and of course, in their minds, we profess the correct Christian faith. So, of course, yes. And we all know it's really the Methodists that do that. So. Um, <laughs> all right, well, to get back around to the uh, question then of authority that uh, we've sort of been dancing around, and that will lead us, I'm hoping today, I'm, I'm pretty much on time where I want to be. Um, so keep your fingers crossed that I'm going to get there. But uh, we'll make it today to medieval Rus, and uh, I hope you'll see some connections then with what we've been talking about and why it's important for understanding what's going on in Russia and Ukraine right now. 
because they are going to be heirs of this tradition. They are going to look back upon the Roman Empire or the later Roman Empire, if you want to call it that, or as we start calling it in about the eighth century, the Byzantine Empire. And again, it's basically the eastern part of the old Roman Empire. As the West, as Edmund, Edward Gibbon says, um, the West, the Rome falls at this last um, uh, emperor when he is deposed in the West, Rome falls. The folks over here say, no, we just lost the West for a while. They regain it briefly under the person that I'm gonna spend most of the rest of the time talking about here, Justinian or as he's known in the Eastern Orthodox Church, St. Justinian, because of what he does for orthodoxy. But at any rate, of course, Constantinople is up here. Uh, you've got, again, the uh, three other patriarchs here. You got Rome over here. Another, another time, another, another issue. Uh, but the time in which sort of these ideas really begin to congeal, that you've got the emperor, the patriarchs and the councils, and this makes up, this triangle makes up then the authority in this Christian political state, this overtly understood Christian empire, All right? And the time in which this really um, uh, takes root is when this guy is um, emperor, Justinian, um, who, as you saw from the map previously, uh, does a number of things. One, he has his great general Belisarius reconquer a great deal of the old western part of the empire. Uh, Italy, parts of Spain, parts of North Africa again. He wants to put it all back together. He basically bankrupts the country doing it, but this is, and that's why it doesn't last very long, but this is part of what he does. Uh, he marries a woman uh, many years younger than himself, Theodora, who is truly, and again, in the Orthodox Church, St. Theodora. She is truly one of the most significant women in history. Very, very powerful figure in her own right. Uh, certainly between the two of them, uh, significant political power. In fact, uh, riots break out. There's an insurrection. You all know that word nowadays. Um, there's an insurrection that breaks out in Constantinople early in Justinian's reign, and he starts putting on old rags and is going to slip out of town at night. And Theodora comes to him and says, well, you do what you want to do. But for me, purple makes a very nice burial shroud. And so Justinian takes off his clothes, puts on his imperial robe, goes out, says he's going to offer peace to the insurrectionist. He brings 30,000 of them into the Hippodrome in downtown, Const downtown Constantinople, central Constantinople, and he has Belisarius slaughter them all. Um, but at any rate, uh, let's talk a little more about uh, Justinian's accomplishments. One of the things he does is to build the great church of Hagia Sophia. Please never call it the Church of St. Sophie. Mm, that's right. Um, Sophia is the Greek word for wisdom, wisdom in particular. Uh, so it is the Church of Holy Wisdom. It's actually dedicated to the Holy Spirit, Holy Wisdom. And uh, today uh, it has some uh, minarets around it because the Ottomans converted it into a mosque. But uh, this particular image has taken those off. And have any of you ever been to Istanbul to see this? Um, okay, all right, very good, very good. It's magnificent, isn't it? It is truly one of the most, the interior space in this building was the largest in the world until like the 19th century or something. It had the largest dome. And the odd thing is it's built right on top of an earthquake fault. And yet it's uh, this huge dome, and you'll notice the dome is even then uh, cut up into a number of windows, and we have travelers accounts who say they would come in and the sun coming in through those windows made the dome look like it was just floating in space. 
magnificent, magnificent space. Uh, Justinian builds other churches, but this is the one that really seals his reputation. When I say he builds them, of course, he hires, uh, actually not architects, he hires two mathematicians, and he says, figure out how to do this. This is what I want, figure out how to do it, and they did. So magnificent, magnificent building there, and um, as you enter into uh, the building, um, it's recently be, been reconverted into a mosque by Turkey's very conservative president. Um, during the time when Turkey became a republic in the 1920s until about three or four years ago, it was a state museum and you could visit it at any time. Uh, you don't go in this way, but if you were living in Justinian's time, you would enter into Hagia Sophia under this particular portal and again, to, to emphasize the idea that what, what we have in Constantinople and the Roman Empire, as they continue to see it, what we have there is a Christian empire, where you have Constantinople, excuse me, Constantine presenting the city of Constantinople to the Virgin Mary and the Christ child. And then on this side, Justinian presenting the great church at Hagia Sophia. It's an amazing, amazing mosaics. In fact, the mosaics, there was so much gold on the mosaics in the building that it just glittered. Um, when the Turks came in being Muslim and opposed to images, they plastered over all of them. But during the period when it was under uh, the control of the Turkish state, a lot of the plaster was removed. And so you can see again, um, some of the great gold and um, uh, you know, just the magnificent mosaic artwork that's in there. All right, so authority then. How does Justinian conceive of, of his authority as the emperor of an Orthodox Christian empire? Well, uh, this particular mosaic is very instructive. Uh, even after um, uh, most of the West that Belisarius had reconquered had fallen again back to these Germanic groups, uh, the empire hang on, hung on to the little town of Ravenna in Eastern Italy. And so some of the best Byzantine artwork, Byzantine again, meaning this kind of later empire with its capital at Constantinople, a lot of the best Byzantine artwork is in Ravenna, Italy, particularly at the church of um, uh, San um, Apollinaire, Nuovo, I forget which one it is. Um, should, have, should have put that in my notes. Um, senior moments, you know. Okay, all right, I'm a, thank you, thank you. <laughs> at any rate, um, as you approach the altar area in this church, uh, it's in a, circular space, because of course, very traditional in Orthodox churches, the dome. Uh, again, the, the Pantocrator, the Christ is emperor, oftentimes is in the dome of Orthodox churches, right? In fact, that's the plans for the Greek Orthodox church over here in Montford. Uh, if you go and uh, go during the Greek festival, get some good food, watch some Greek dancing, and then do the church tour, and they will explain the icons, the iconostasis, and talk about their plans then for the dome, which will be a large image of Christ's Pantocrator. So all of these things that, you know, some of you are thinking, my gosh, this was almost 2,000 years ago. They're still very relevant, still very current for a lot of folks. At any rate, let's take a look at this. Um, again, a, a sort of curved wall here. Um, depicting Justinian in the center. You see him. What's around his head? A halo. Again, he's considered a holy figure, a religious figure. This is while he was still alive. Uh, you also see he's wearing the imperial crown. Uh, anyone know what he's holding? And think about the fact that it's close to the altar in the church. Uh, the bread. He's holding the paten that holds the bread that will be used for communion, be used for the Greek word, of course, is Eucharist, which means Thanksgiving. So he's holding the bread for the Eucharist. He is attended then on this one side by um, 
the Praetorian Guard, uh, folks you see over here, the emperor's personal guard, um, then by senators, uh, Constantinople continued the tradition of having a Roman Senate. So you got the senators here. On this side, then, you have ecclesiastical authorities. You've got the uh, current pastor of the church, Maximius, uh, two deacons represented here, one holding the book of the Gospels, another holding a censer for the incense. Um, then a lot of scholars think that the, the, the head sticking in the background here is Belisarius, the great general who got added in at the last moment. So they just, they didn't have room for him. So they stuck his head in back there. Uh, but, well, before I, before I tell you the but, um, what do you think this mosaic represents in regards to power and authority? How would you describe the message that it's sending out? Church and state are very, the, the two authorities that God has given to humankind. Which one is more powerful? Well, here's, here's the but part. One of the conventions in Byzantine art was look at their feet. If their feet, if they're stepping on somebody else's toes, this means they have authority over the Senate, over the Praetorian Guard, in other words, over the civil government and the military. Uh, here you've got Maximian stepping on the foot of the deacon, right? So indicating his superiority on this side. What do you see right here? Nobody's stepping on anyone's foot. What does this mean? Well, here's what Justinian explained that it meant in one of his novella, one of his new Roman laws. And by the way, Justinian revised the old code of Roman law. Um, it is still the basis of most Western law today. Um, so again, there's relevance here in these things even centuries ago. But in one of the novella, in other words, one of the new laws that he adds to the old Roman law, he says this, the greatest blessings of mankind are the gifts of God, which have been granted us by the mercy on high. These gifts are the priesthood and the imperial authority. The priesthood ministers to things divine. The imperial authority is set over and ministers to human affairs, but both proceed from the one and the same source. Therefore, nothing could be a greater matter of concern to the emperor than that the dignity and honor of the clergy who serve him as they continuously offer prayers to God on his behalf. For if the priesthood were well ordered and in all respects without blame and full of faith before God, and if the imperial authority rightly and duly adorns the commonwealth committed to his charge, there will ensue a, I'm going to give you a Greek word here, a harmonia, which will serve the good and benefit of the human race. Harmonia, sound like a, any English words? Harmony, harmony. Another term that Justinian uses is symphonia, a symphony. This is the ideal. Emperor, imperial authority, the ecclesiastical authority, again, the patriarchates, the councils. This is the ideal. The way in which it works, though, is that in 553, Justinian decides to call another council, if you're keeping score, this is the fifth overall, so he can be sure that theologians with whom he disagrees, including dead ones, get properly condemned. All right, so here's the theory. How does it work out in practice? All right, two minutes, two minutes. I want to finally tie it to what I said at the very beginning, all this was about. And this is all prelude to really getting around to um, well, here's Theodora's on the other wall. And interestingly, she's carrying the chalice that holds the wine. But um, uh, 
Justinian dies in 565. In 570, five years later, a young boy is born in the city of Mecca to a widowed mother. He will become, of course, the prophet Muhammad, and the religion that he founds uh, spreads quickly after his death into a large part of the old Roman world, North Africa, into Asia, uh, up to the very uh, edge of the Byzantine Empire. It incorporates all of these Christians who have broken all of these communities that have broken with Constantinople over Chalcedon. And you might say that they're thinking, oh, we wish we were back under Christian rule. No, they were persecuted under Byzantine rule because they weren't orthodox in the Byzantine opinion. The Muslims didn't care. And so you have these Christians living in Islamic areas that are happy to be there because they're allowed to practice their faith, something they would not be able to do if they had Byzantine authority over them. But, and here's my concluding thought. Um, all right, Byzantine Empire is here. Of course, you got Christianity over here, what's well, going to become Catholic Roman Catholicism. Uh, you've got Islam here then. Uh, and of course, uh, the Church of the East, the Orthodox, um, the Oriental Orthodox. Um, if you want to spread, if you want to spread the faith of Constantinople, where's the only place you can go? Brother Cyril and Methodius travel up to the lands of the Slavs and convert there and actually write the alphabet and create a written language for the Slavs and their capital in Kiev or Kiev, uh, the foundation of the empire of the Rus, All right? So notice uh, Kherson, uh, the Crimean Peninsula, Kiev, Moscow. These all become uh, sort of satellites of the Byzantine authority in Constantinople when Constantinople falls to the Turks in 1453, Moscow becomes the new Rome, the third Rome, and they inherit this understanding of being an Orthodox Christian state. And that's what we were gonna start all of this with um, three weeks ago, and I finally got to it. Uh, so, so I'm here now. So um, at any rate, uh, I, I know I'm out of time. Thank you very much. and. Um, I'll see you again sometime soon, I hope. So. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. It was sort of the idea that, you know, What's in Western Europe now was once ours, and uh, we want it back. And uh, again, he was, Belisarius was such a um, military strategist that he was able to deliver it, but Justinian basically bankrupted the empire trying to do it. So um, there were still a few outposts that were left that eventually start, you know, being picked off by the expansion of the Islamic Caliphate. But um, yeah, it's this very similar idea. And again, think, Ancient Rus, Rus, from which we get the word Russia, the first capital was Kiev. And they inherit again this, this Byzantine idea. I mean, you know, we grew up in the era of the Soviet Union and atheistic communism, you know, two words that seem to always go together. We don't think about the old Imperial Russian Empire as seeing itself as the new Christian Orthodox Empire the heir, the direct heir of Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire. Yes, sir. Um, that is a great question to which I will defer to the theologians. <laughs> uh, yeah, one, one wonders, uh, and again, you know, it's, it, to some of us, it seems a little foreign that, you know, you would spend this much time and effort over whether it's two natures in one nature or two natures in one person. 
but you know, the idea was if you're going to call yourselves Orthodox Christianity, you've got to divine very precisely what that means, and then you enforce it. And that's well, there are political comments that one could make, but one one declines. <laughs> yes, sir. Right. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I do, I will say in my classes, I do spend some time looking at the liturgy, which in all Orthodox churches is chanted throughout. You know, there's, there's no, um, uh, except for a sermon or something like that, but the liturgy itself is chanted, um, very richly adorned, the vestments uh, as we talked about in here, come from, you know, the ancient Roman um, vestments of the traditional priest who would have been associated with the imperial power. And so, um, you know, to attend an Orthodox divine liturgy today is to really see a very different, well, as, as we like to say in religious studies, uh, what we like to do is make the familiar seem strange and the strange seem familiar. And uh, it would be a very kind of familiar looking thing, but yet with, you know, some, some significant differences that I do think are, you know, um, worth our knowing about uh, or us in the West. So, yeah, yeah. Um, anything else? 